so we are in John chapter 6, and just a quick recap of last time. Um, we saw Jesus in the midst of chaos, right? In the midst of this thousands of crowds, sending him away, making time to pray. And we know that that shows us the, and the fact that Jesus even takes his time out and, and constantly throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus constantly going out to pray. And if Jesus needs to pray, how much more do we need to pray? You know, this is the example um, that he, he showed us with his life. Um, prayer is vital to the believer. Prayer is a vital aspect of our growth. It's a vital aspect, aspect of our, our, our life as Christians. All right, so we need to make sure we take care of that and we foster and nurture that time that we have with the Father, with our Father in heaven. And, you know, this is one of the benefits that we have as children of God. Um, if you're familiar with the scriptures, you'll, you'll understand that what God the Father says about the, the wicked, those who don't know him, those who aren't um, believers, those who don't have faith, that God, he turns his ear away from them. That he, he like literally turns his face away as they pray to him. Because he's not going to listen to that. But for us who are his children, I mean, we have access, unrestricted access to our Heavenly Father. And, and that's, that's something really special. It's such a huge benefit that we have as God's children, his blood-bought children. All right, and this is super important to know, especially in light of what else we learned last week. And that's that sometimes, like the disciples, um, Jesus sent them into the storm. And it, it was hard for them. It was tiring. They were struggling. And at times also with us, that we get sent into a storm as well. That we will struggle. We will um, get tired. We may even be overwhelmed. We, we must learn that. You know, in those times, we should seek God and remember that just like the disciples, um, when they were out in the storm, what was Jesus doing? Not only was he praying, but he was watching over them. He was seeing them struggle. He was seeing them in the middle of the storm. And God has his eye over them and God has his eyes on us. He's watching over us and he, he's growing us and, and working in us, refining us into the image of Jesus. And on the other side of that, we can glorify God. And we can say, this is what God has done for us. Look, look at how he has moved. Look at how he has, has glorified himself. And the disciples, they learned that lesson. That they, um, they saw, if you remember, what John shows us in this gospel, which is the fifth sign that John recalls of Jesus. And that's Jesus walking on the water in the middle of a crazy storm, wind blowing, it's, it's, it's just crazy. And it's in that storm, in, in that, the wind and the waves that Jesus comes and he reveals himself to his disciples, I am. He reveals to, to his disciples to be the great I am from the Old Testament. Go to um, Psalm chapter 77. You're not going to see that up there. I was reading this this morning. And I'm like, wow, that's like exactly what was going on over here. Psalm 77. Look at verse 16 to 19. It says, and I read this, and as I was reading this, like this is the story of Jesus walking on the water. The water saw you, O God. The water saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea. Your path in the great waters. And your footsteps were not known. Isn't that like Jesus walking on the water? Right in the midst of imagine lightning or you know the wind, and there's God, and the waters saw God, and they were afraid, not Jesus. So it was Jesus who brought them through the storm afterwards, right? Jesus, he presents himself, I am, 
And then immediately it tells us that, that they were on the other side. Jesus took him through that storm. They don't even know how it happened. Right? And that, that's, that's exactly how it is sometimes with us. We don't even know how we got through something. But we know that God was in it. We know that God was in the middle of it. God taking care of us. Now, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, this is where we pick up our story in John chapter 6. We'll start in verse 22. It says, On the following day, when the people were sta- who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there were... There was no other boat there except that one which the disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. That of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So we begin this portion of scripture with the people, right? The people who had seen this amazing, um, the fourth sign, the feeding of over 15,000 people, men, women, children, and they experience this amazing miracle and they want more. They want more. So they seek Jesus out. Now, these, deci- these, um, these people saw the disciples get in the boat. They saw them go into the water and they knew that Jesus wasn't with them. They saw Jesus on a mountain and they saw the disciples out. And Jesus stayed behind. And verse 25 says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And these people are genuinely confused. And in some sense, they seem like they actually care about Jesus. But their motives for their interest in Jesus, it's not because they love him. It's because they like the benefits that come with Jesus. Now, Jesus, as always, he, he sees the heart and the intentions of men, and he cuts through all the pretense, just goes straight to the core. And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You know, the body of Christ, right, the true body of Christ, the people of God, were very loving. They're very giving. And the truth is, many people, they'll come to church and they love the way that church makes them feel. They, they, the fellowship, right? The brotherhood, the sisterhood. You guys, um, you're going to have that thing tomorrow with the ladies. And it, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's nice. And the body, 
provides food and the body provides services. And many churches, they, they, they do a lot of social things, right? Providing for communities. But the question Jesus wants to know, the question that Jesus asks, the question that he, he uses and he pierces right through all of that, he says to us, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What are you doing here? And listen, I get it, of course. I mean, if it's a God-fearing, Bible-teaching church, of course, you know, the peace of God is there. You know, and it, it is good. Um, behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together is what we learn in the Old Testament. It, it's, it is beautiful and it is wonderful. And of course it is. But if your primary purpose in seeking Jesus is not because you desire Jesus, right? It's not because you want to grow in him. It's not because you want to glorify your life in him. If Jesus is not your treasure, if he is not everything, listen, Jesus must be everything. And if Jesus is not everything to you, then verse 26 that Jesus is speaking is for you. And that's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be. Look at what Jesus responds. Uh, he continues, actually, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. These people, they wanted the bread. They wanted the loaves. They wanted the fish. And they were concerned with their earthly appetites, their earthly desires. But Jesus is interested in way more than those things. He's interested more in our eternal souls. He's, he's interested more in our eternity. And even today, I, you know, I, I don't know your motives. I don't know, I can't see your hearts. And I, I don't even know what brought you here. Or, you know, maybe even through the internet. Someone's listening to the sound of my voice right now. And here's what you need to know. I don't know why you're here. What you need to know is that Jesus is interested in your soul. That Jesus loves you. That Jesus desires to be with you. And he's interested in your eternal condition. That you would have everlasting life. And only Jesus has the ability to even offer that. Why? Because the Father has set his seal on the sun. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And they're like, Okay, Jesus, I, I, I like what I'm hearing. I, I like what you're saying about eternal life. What do I need to do? Right? Isn't that what we always reduce um, what Jesus and what God desires from us to? To, to what can we do? What must we do to earn heaven? That's what the typical response of humanity is, is how can I earn heaven? And that's what these people want to know. And this, this line of thought, this line of reasoning has birthed so many different religions, thousands of religions. Every religion, ex with the exception of Christianity, what can I do to earn heaven? Do, do I got to go knock on doors? Right? Do I got to uh, pray certain prayers or, or maybe I got to face a certain direction when I'm praying? Or do, do I got to abstain from coffee? Maybe um, certain activities? Or, you know, maybe I got to follow a certain diet to, to earn salvation? And ultimately, what all these religions have in common is what is known as workspace salvation. That if I do such and such, then... I would have earned my way into heaven on my own steam, in my own strength. I get the credit. Me, me, me. Here's a great quote from um, Boise. He says, The human mind is always flattered when, it's, when it is conscious, conscious of doing something for God. What is more, for his doings, man considers himself entitled to a reward. How pleased we should, be, we should all be if we could only earn salvation, 
In that case, we would have succeeded in bringing God into the humbling position of being in debt to us, and we would love it. But this is not the way of salvation. Christianity is not based on what I can do. It's Christianity, the foundation of Christianity, is based on what God has done for me, what God has already accomplished for me on my behalf. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 4 through 9. Ephesians 2, 4 to 9. This is Paul speaking. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Jesus has done the work required for us to enter into eternity. He has done the work on our behalf. 1 Peter 2.24 says that He bore our sins on His body. That He has borne it on Himself. Believing faith and trust in Jesus is all that is required. It's all we need to do. And that's what Jesus says. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And this is the work. If you want to work, if you want to work for salvation, okay, here, here's the response. Fine, you want to work? Here. What's the work? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That's it. Believe in the Son of God of God who the Father has sent to do a work on our behalf. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. We don't have to labor, right? We don't have to struggle with salvation. We don't got to worry about, did I do enough today? Or did I not do enough today? All those things, did I do enough? Did I not do enough? Those are burdens that you were not meant to carry. Those are burdens that have been laid on Jesus Christ. And you don't need to pick him up. He has done all the work for your salvation. The work of God is to believe in the one whom the Father has sent. It's that simple. And unfortunately... To many, it's unbelievable. And it sounds unbelievable. No, no way it's that easy. And to the crowd in front of Jesus that he's speaking to, they want more. They want more. They say in verse 30, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? And, I mean, instantly my first response to that is, um, did you not see what Jesus did with the bread? I mean, the fish feeding, you know, 15,000 plus people. Were you not there? Hello? Yet these people, it's not enough. They want more. They saw the bread and fish multiply. But the thing is, to the heart and heart, even if Jesus were to rise from the dead, it wouldn't be enough. If their heart is hard, it won't be enough. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And they go on to point to Moses and what happened with the Israelites when they found themselves in the desert. But they inadvertently, they twist the scripture. They, 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 they take it and they kind of make it something else that it's not. And what's ironic here is that the same way they mess up 
the, the manna narrative, what was going on there, what was really going on there, they mess up the miracle of the bread and the fish. Their focus was on Moses, not on the one who actually sent the manna. They were more interested in Moses. And with Jesus, they were more focused on the bread and the fish rather than the one who multiplied the bread and the fish. They wanted the bread and not the bread giver. And this is why Jesus corrects them. He, in verse 32, then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus corrects their understanding. He lets them know Moses was just a vessel. Moses was just a vessel that the Father used. But the glory belonged to the Father. He's the one who made it rain down. And what's more, the manna that came down from heaven in the Old Testament, that whole exodus that the Israelites were being fed, that was just a type. The whole purpose of that was simply a type. It was a, a shadow, a foreshadowing of the true bread that came down from heaven. It's a foreshadow of the true bread that the Father sent, that the Father provided. And this true bread is life-giving. This true bread is a person. And they don't entirely grasp what Jesus is saying, right? They're not quite getting it. Then they said to him, and they're still thinking about their earthly appetites. They're thinking, still thinking about, you know, temporal. What can I get? How can I satisfy my carnal needs? Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They just want to not be hungry again. This is very reminiscent of what happened with the Samaritan woman. Go to chapter 4 of John. Let's turn the page over. And you'll see the same type of thing going on with the Samaritan woman in verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would, ha you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water, the well water, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up to everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And the woman, she didn't get it at the time either. But the words that Jesus is speaking here, it's spirit. He's speaking spiritual words. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And th this is a great verse because this explains a lot. This is going to explain a lot in your life. When you tell people about Jesus, when you talk about the Bible, when you talk about worship music, and you love worshiping the Lord, and you love being with the Lord, and you love, why do you go to church so much? That's so weird. Well, I love the people of God. It doesn't make sense. Just like the, the spiritual words that Jesus is speaking, they don't understand. Look at what this says in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Do you see that? It's not going to make sense to a lot of people why you love Jesus. Because they won't know. 
It's foolishness. They can't know. Because it takes a spiritual, born-again believer to understand the things of God. You ever, you ever notice? I don't know about you, but for me, when right before I got saved, um, I lived with my grandma for a little while. And I remember, I said this many times, but her Bible used to be on her sewing machine that she had in the corner. And I remember one day going up to the Bible and just like flipping the pages. and I t It was like, I was blind, okay? I was literally blind to the Word of God. It was like, like just jarbled words. I'm like, what is, what is even going on here? It's, it's foolishness, right? My grandmother, me, every morning reading this, I, it makes no sense to me. But then, when the blindness is taken away, and I'm given the Spirit of God, everything's changed. Now, I approach the Word of God, and it's alive. And, and it, you know, I, I know some of you laugh at me when I refer to the Word of God as, you know, it's juicy, right? It's because it's juicy. There's so much depth and richness to the Word of God. You understand when, when uh, I, think, I believe it was the prophet who said his word was like honey in his mouth. And then it goes down and it became bitter. And I get that as well. That sometimes the, the word, and we're going we're gonna to see, not this week, we'll see it next week, but sometimes what the word says is a hard truth. But it is so good. God's word is so good. I, I don't, you know, again, I, in my natural mind, I don't get why people don't see it, but the word tells us. They can't see it. It just doesn't make sense. Again, so these people that Jesus is talking to, their focus is on the here and now. Feed me, feed me, feed me. Give me something to eat. What? You mean there's bread and I'll never have to eat bread again? This is great. This is great news. And Jesus clears things up. Then he said to them, or then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. And here, Jesus declares a major, major statement. And we went over this last week when he showed himself to the disciples. And that was private to the disciples who, who were perishing but now he, he declares it to this group of people. He says, I am the bread of life. Jesus takes on the divine name, Yahweh. I am that I am. That name that was spoken through the burning bush to Moses. And he takes it for himself. And he says, I am the bread of life. And in doing so, in revealing this, that he is the bread of life, he tells us a little bit about his nature, about who he is. And he tells us something about himself. And that is that he who has Jesus will never hunger. He who has Jesus will never thirst. Jesus, unlike what the world has to offer, only Jesus can truly satisfy the deepest and most basic need of humanity. Only Jesus can truly give us the sustenance of our souls. Only Jesus sustains us like bread, like food. The same way if if you were famished in a desert, crawling for three days straight without food or water and the sun beating on you, the same way you would have a desire for food and water and how that, once you eat it, that would nourish you and you'd, you'd be regenerated and rejuvenated and strengthened. In that same way, Jesus is for us. He sustains our soul. He feeds our soul. He is that living water that we need. And if you are trying to live your life apart from the giver of life, 
if you're trying to live your life apart from Christ, you will fail. And I know you guys are here right now, which is great, but remember that. Please remember that. Because I don't know where you're going after high school. I don't know to the many, many places you're going to be and the things you're going to forget that you were taught. But you got to know that apart from Jesus, you will not be satisfied. You will not be satisfied. And the Word of God says that sin is pleasing. Yeah, it's for a season. Right? Right? You guys know this to be true. When you're sinning in the middle of your sin, in the midst of your sin, I mean, it's pleasurable. Right? But then afterwards comes the condemnation, the destruction, right? the enemy. It's for a season, it's fine. But its end is death. And you guys have to know, and you got to remember. Remember, when you guys are out there doing your thing, remember that Jesus is life. And there's nothing better than Jesus. Only He can truly sustain you. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Maybe. You look at the world around you. You see um, people who aren't believers, who don't love Jesus, right? You look at um, Bill Gates, Microsoft, one of the world's richest men, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, right? These men who... They're unbelievers, and, and you look at them, and look at the heights they've reached. Look at, I mean, they're, they're surrounded. I mean, they, they can literally do, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Scrooge McDuck, but, you know, from DuckTales, he, he would have this, he would swim in money. These men could literally have a building filled with money and swim in it. Swim in it. And that's exactly what's going on with this crowd here. They want the bread. They want the temporary satisfaction. Now, I didn't say that without Christ you won't acquire things. I mean, you may actually, maybe you're the next Jeff Bezos and you have many possessions. Maybe all your wildest dreams come true. But apart from Christ, without, apart from the true bread of life, without Him, those things are worthless. You know, did you know that Americans are the wealthiest in the world? They're the wealthiest people in the world. I mean, if I were to ask you guys to pull out your phones, you know, some of you are walking around with, you know, $700 phones, crying out loud, you know, or, or even a phone, <laughs> you know. I, I what was it? The average person, I don't want to get this wrong, but I, I believe it's the average person makes about $20 a month around the world. You spend $20, you know, <laughs> going, going down the street, going to Culver's after you leave here. Easily. Americans are the wealthiest in the world. Yet, Americans suffer from the highest rate of suicide in the world. They suffer from the highest rate of depression worldwide. Your possessions cannot sustain your soul. What you acquire cannot satisfy. Your possessions will not last. You can't take them with you when you die. And without Jesus, your possessions will perish. Just like you. You will perish without Jesus. And to those who say, right, the, for the Christians who say they follow Jesus, but find their strength in their worth and their worth in what they own. Look at what 
the word says. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, verse 14. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Laodicea. He says, and to the angel, and that's just another word for pastor, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And it, by the way, he's writing this to a church. Okay, this is Jesus knocking on the doors of the church. Let me in. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19. 21. Matthew says, Do not lay up for yourselves. Actually, this is Jesus speaking in the Gospel of Matthew. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither wrath nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's not sinful to have money. We've said this before. It's, it's sinful when money has a hold of you. Right? It's in, um, I believe it's in Peter. They talks about for to the to those who are rich, that they would be sharing their money. Actually, no, it's in First Timothy, end of First Timothy, that they, the rich would take their money and use it for the body of Christ. Right. So it's not wrong to be rich, but it's wrong to trust in riches. It's wrong that your treasure is found in riches rather than in Jesus. The question Jesus lays out here is, what do you treasure? What do you treasure? Do you treasure Jesus? Continuing in John 6, verse 36, But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. He's telling him, you have seen everything. I have shown you the signs. I have shown you the miracle, yet you still don't believe? What do you want? You want more? All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. That is so comforting to know. That the Father will never turn you away. And this is great for you to know. Because again, I don't know what journey your life is going to take you. But know this. That no matter where you find yourself in life. You could always run to the Father. He will not reject you. You can't go so far from God that he, he, he won't find you. You can't sin so much before God that, yeah, I'm done with this one. No. No matter where you find yourself, there is forgiveness in Christ. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Even now, through the preached word of God, as, as I speak God's word, you guys hear it, someone out there is hearing it. God is drawing people unto himself. He is calling people unto himself. And if you respond to that call, you will find him. You will find life, life in Christ, the true bread from heaven. But here's the deal, to have that life, you must come. You must come. Trust and faith in what Jesus has done for you is all that's required. That's the work. Trusting that when you repent from your sins and when you believe that he died for your sins, that he took your place on that cross, that you will be forgiven. Trust and faith will bring you into the Father's arms and you will spend eternal life in heaven with Jesus.